today on Match Play. Help me understand how you play in two Ryder Cups, and then you're chosen for the third one, and you win, honey. Well, tell me that story. That's a very important story, and Grant. I want to clear okay. it up because right. a lot of people have given you hell over that. Well, they should. Tom Weisskopf, golfing icon with 16 PGA Tour victories, as well as the coveted British Open title. Extraordinary combination of power and grace. But did you know he's most famous for a title he never wanted? When I go back and I look at Tom Weisskopf, who started playing at 15 years old, you were a natural at the game. Um, you began to shoot in the 70s within a year or so of playing golf. and. You were a natural athlete. Uh, you, you had a, a fantastic career. Talk to me a little bit about your talent. Somebody from the tour that played with you told me just recently that of all the players that they played against, and they're, they mean the greatest during your era, that you had more talent than anybody else. Is that, is that a fair statement? Well, it's flattering, that remark, uh, that compliment. Um, I did things very easily. Um, I learned th uh, from great players. Uh, I was taught correctly to start with the fundamentals of the game. I had a game that had power. Uh, it had good control. Uh, I had finesse. But I learned that from great players uh, through emulation. I think a lot of us have learned this game by watching people execute on the practice tee. Then a question goes to them, and if you could get the right answer, that was hard in our times. You know, they didn't want to give up too much information, but I befriended, you know, Venturi, Tommy Bolt, Sam Snead. Let's talk about Tommy Thunderbolt Bolt. Uh, he was a big influence on you he was. early in your career. Talk a little bit about Tommy Bolt and what kind of an influence he was, and what about Tommy Bolt's legendary temper out on the tour? Did that? Did that come across to you at all, or did he just help you with your game? Well, let's look at this word perception, okay? To me, it's difficult to achieve, but even more difficult to overcome. And Tom had this perception about him that he was this angry, uh, real temperamental, uh, volatile, spontaneous, unique personality blessed with this tremendous golf swing. Uh, maybe on the golf course, some of those adjectives fit. But off the golf course, uh, as kind a man, as helpful a person, compassionate to a lot of people, giving to a lot of people. So, you know, it, it, it's what you see. It's what you perceive a, of an individual. Tom... Um, you know, just basically um, at times, you know, just was his own worst enemy. I mean, I can relate to that a little bit. I Let's think, talk you know. about that. Let's talk about your relation to that. Do you think that Tom's Thunderbolt's uh, temper, his um, dissatisfaction with himself sometimes in the course, did that rub off on you or were you already that personality? They called you the Towering Inferno. We all know that. And not that you screamed and yelled and cussed and raved and ran it in through your golf clubs. Uh, you didn't. But you did, you did well up with a lot of anger. You've talked about that before. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Uh, well, there might have been a similarity in this with the two personalities that we're talking about, Tommy Bolt, Tom Weisskopf. Both couldn't stand mediocrity. Both realized the talent and the ability, but couldn't stand playing just so-so. The frustration was vented personally, to, to yourself all the time, you know. There were no excuses for 
I didn't like the golf course. I don't want to be in this town, you know, or this and that distraction. I never got fined for throwing golf clubs. You know, I didn't emulate some of the things that Tom was famous for. I think he did that just for, just to be colorful. You sure. know, there's some great stories about Tommy. Sure. Bull. You know, he's quite a character, great humor. But I, I think, uh, you know, getting back to me, uh, I just couldn't deal with not playing well all the time, you know. How did that manifest itself when you were on the golf course? When you hit a shot that wasn't up to your standard? When you missed a green? When you missed a putt? And then the fumes would start to rise within. Well, well, how did that manifest itself inside you? Lost my concentration. Lost my confidence, you know. Uh, took some time to regain it. Sometimes I could get it back, you know, in the next shot. Sometimes it would take me a hole. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it never left that whole day, you know, and I had to wait till the next day to, to redeem myself and hopefully that, you know, I could turn things around. I also had another part of my life that was very devoted and very interested in the outdoor sports, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, still today, I do a lot of fly fishing. You know, I did a lot of big game hunting. I, now I'm an avid bird shooter. I, I shoot competitively, you know, sporting clay shotgun shooting. I did a lot of competitive rifle shooting. Uh, you know, I snow ski. You know, I ride horses. I, I had reining horses. I, I did all kinds of things outdoors. So golf didn't consume my life, mm -hmm. you know. But your drive, your motivation, you had other interests. It was not to go on and win 75 golf tournaments and 20 majors. Well, I just never wanted to be the world's greatest golfer. That was ne never my motivation for playing the game. I, I like playing the game. I like playing it correctly. Yeah. I worked on my swing. I worked in improving my all aspects of my game. I got more, as much satisfaction out of going out there, and at the end of the day, my score might have been 68, Ray. But you know what I said to myself? It was bogey free. I missed one fairway. I hit missed three greens. I hit the ball exactly where I wanted to on everything. That gave me tremendous satisfaction. And maybe, you know, I didn't look at it like it, I had to make money. You know, I knew it was always going to be there. Yeah. It's just that I enjoyed playing the game. Playing but hunting it. also oh. was a huge passion and a huge love of yours right during those years. Sure. Help I, me understand how you play in two Ryder Cups and then you're chosen for the third one and you went hunting. Well, Tell me that story. That's a very important story. I'm glad I want to clear okay. it up because right. a lot of people have given you hell over that. Well, they should. And now it's time to improve your game with Jim McLean. The best-selling author and swing guru to the professional tour's biggest stars. Here's Jim. This is a paintbrush. What am I doing with a paintbrush? What does this have to do with golf? Well, let me tell you, this is one of the great ideas I learned from Ken Venturi. Venturi had this neat little idea. He kind of got it from watching Hogan. And he said, Ben had a little move, it was almost a little drag, where he dragged the club a little bit this way when he started, and then he set the club. And when he came down, he had this action. So he said it was as if you were painting a wall going back and then painting the wall coming down. So if the wall was here, you'd paint the wall this way. You can't push a brush. You can't, obviously you can't paint that way. Use the paintbrush idea. You don't have to go buy a paintbrush, but just use the idea as if you had a paintbrush, you hit some phenomenal shots. Don't go away. We'll be right back after these messages. Are you an E or a C? Both have Ridgeback. These are loaded with tech. Which one are you gaming? Definitely E for me. It's just so forgiving. I'm definitely an E. C is for Cheka. What else? C is for kill it. C is me. Low spinning bombs. So, are you an E or a C? Hmm. I don't know. Hey, wait a minute. Pound for pound, nothing comes close.
lot of hot. We're like any normal family. We just get shorter wait times because we buy and book online at discounttire.com. So easy. Which gives us more time for things like... Oh, come on, Mom. <laughs> Ready? And it's all thanks to Kyle. <laughs> Get 30% shorter average wait time when you buy and book online at DiscountTire.com. Let's get you taken care of. You've heard me talk about Squares Golf Shoes and how they help you hit the golf ball further. And many of you are saying, oh, come on, Faldo, give us a break. How is that possible? But yes, they do. And it's proven with science. What we noticed with the Square Shoes was the shoe keeps the pressure in a more stable fashion towards inside of the trail heel, allowing pressure to get to the lead side, generating much more club and speed and distance gain. Visit squares.com. Change your shoes, change your game. Squares, the distance golf shoe. And now back to more match play with Ray Adams. I Help me understand how you play in two Ryder Cups and then you're chosen for the third one and you went hunting. Well, Tell me that story. That's a very important story. I'm glad I want to clear okay. it up because right. a lot of people have given you hell over that. Well, they should. Tell me about it. But I have a side to it, too. There's always two sides to every Absolutely. story. Absolutely. Okay, I re it's one of my big regrets in life, especially in my golfing career, rejecting playing, representing my country in the third Ryder Cup, okay? Yeah. All right. At that time, in the Ryder Cup years that you know, I had my chance to play in. Uh, it was the Lions against the Christians. They couldn't beat us. It was basically over after the morning on Sunday. Now, you played in 73. 73 you and 75. You played in 75. What was your experience? What did you take away from those two? Well, it was Cups? great. You know, in 73, my first uh, Ryder Cup, that was at Muirfield. I was the defending um, uh, Open champion, you know, and I just couldn't believe. I thought, when I left True and everybody loved me, when I when I was on their soil for the Ryder Cup, you know, everybody I, hated you. I, well, I don't know if they hated me, but they didn't clap for me like they did, you know. During, and I hit a lot of good shots during that Ryder Cup, you know. But there were very few claps like this, you know. I could see how important it was to them, sure. but still, it was the Lions against the Christians. I right. mean, it, 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 there was no way we were going to lose, you know. Yeah. Okay, so I experienced, then I went to League and Air. Arnold was the captain, it was great, you know, and we just demolished them. I won all five of my matches, and I finally said on the sixth match to Arnold, I said, let somebody else play. We had already won the morning of Sunday. Again, it was a real thumping, okay? So that didn't bother me, you know, because, I, but I needed one more sheep for the Grand Slam of sheep. And I had booked my hunt the week after uh, that week in Ligonier in the fall in Latrobe, Pennsylvania to go to Alaska to, to get my doll sheep. There's four North American sheep. You've got the Rocky Mountain Bighorn, the Desert Bighorn, and the Stone. Okay. The doll is the last of the four. And there was only about 400 people in the world that ever accomplished that. That and was they had one of, all four. That was one of my goals. Okay? So it wasn't the Grand Slam of golf you were after. No, no, no. no. You were after the Grand Slam right. of... So I got Tom Place, okay. great friend of mine, great writer, who actually turned out to be the PGA Tour secretary. Great friend of mine that I had befriended back in Cleveland, Ohio, was a sports writer there. Tom, you need to help me with writing this letter, would you? He said, sure. What, what do you, my intent is to write this letter to tell the PGA of America that I was not going to compete under any circumstances in the 77 Ryder Cup if I was be so lucky to make the team. Mm -hmm. But please don't post my, my points because I don't want to create a controversy. I want somebody else to enjoy what I have for the last two Ryder Cups, okay? Sure. How, how early did you send that letter knowing you were- Two years. You were two years in advance. It was advance. one week after so the last- So they knew. At registered mail, I still have the copy of it, okay? They said they never got it, Ray. What happened in 1977? Well, they publicized it, that I was second on the points, which I was, mm -hmm. second only to Nicholas, mm -hmm. that I was not going to play in the Ryder Cup. And I told the story a couple times, and it was never explained 
quite that way either. Why did they say you wouldn't? Get I don't it? know. I have no idea. You were you were angry about it. Hurt I was about very, it. Yeah, I was angry and hurt. You know. Did you talk to Nicholas or anybody else on the team? No. Dow Nobody Finch, contacted you. Dow Finsterwall called me, who was the captain of the team. Tom, you're not serious. They just told me you were not you're not going to play, and I said. I, war I, I, I warned them, I notified them, whatever you want to call it, Dow, two years ago that I was not going, I have something else that I'd rather do. I've played in two Ryder Cups. It's no contest. Let somebody else have fun. What did Dow say? He said, well, I just can't, you're making a big mistake. I said, maybe I am, but that's the choice that I made two years ago, and I'm sticking by my decision. I'm not going to play. You went hunting, you got your sheep. I got my sheep. I completed the Grand Slam. Yeah. Was crucified. And, and you were crucified. Yeah. Now, looking back on it, what would you have done differently, if anything? Played. Was that Tom Weisskopf being Tom Weisskopf at the time because of where you were in your life and what you wanted to do and the success you'd had already? Uh, were you just, look, I've, I've been there, I've done that, I really want to go do this? Yeah, I think I'm Or were that. you kind of saying, you know what, uh, I'm not doing it? Well, there's another side maybe to the story, too, Okay. In 1968, I had a choice to make whether to go be reclassified 1A and go into the Army or get into the reserve pro program and eliminate the situation or the possibility of going into, uh, you know, war. Uh, so I had some contacts and I did it. Legally and rightfully, I joined the Army Reserves. Mm -hmm. I was 25 and a half years old at the time. Um, at that time, they reclassified all the one A's, as they call them. You're either 4F or you were, you know, in. I had some kind of a physical disability. I really don't know what it was, to tell you the truth, because I'm a pretty physical, capable guy. Okay, I was reclassified. So I got in the Ar Army Reserves, and at that time I was a leading money winner uh, on the tour. And I left the tour in the middle of August, and I wound up being the third leading money winner that year. Okay? So I went, for the next five and a half years, I went back and forth to Columbus, Ohio, every Monday night for a meeting, a four-hour meeting, to avoid going one weekend a month, your eight hour, you know, your 16-hour responsibility, in the reserves because it could fall on a, on, a, on a major tournament and stuff. So that's the choice, what, the reserves. And so you was, went to the meetings instead of being a weekend warrior. Right, Got exactly it. right. Did my things, you know, and, and honorably discharged, you know, did my thing. So also at that time, the Ryder Cup, you, you had to be a PGA pro for at least four and a half years. Can you imagine the first five years of Jack Nicklaus's career? He never played on a Ryder Cup team because of some silly rule because you have to be a pro for four and a half or five years. And now Ricky Fowler gets chosen after only being on tour for one year. Yeah, they're pretty hypocritical, the PGA, okay? We'll be right back after these messages. Introducing the newest addition to Zero Friction's performance arsenal. The Zero Friction Laser Pro Pistol Grip Rangefinder. The Laser Pro comes with a stable, pistol-shaped comfort grip that is lightweight with an easy-to-read scope. The device vibrates when you are zeroed in on your target and conforms with USGA and USGA handicap guidelines. Shoot on point without taking you out of the zone. Golf only exists because it's fun. What is special about golf is the relationships. Being out there with your family, your friends, so many different chances and opportunities are presented from the game of golf. Truman is brilliant. It's always first-class experiences. Courses that they run, they want it to be a, a, as good as possible, and it makes a big difference for the experience. Why wouldn't you select Truman? You're selecting the best of the best. You know the quality you're getting. You know the experience you're getting. There's nobody better. 
How many shots do you throw away from the sand, the rough, or even the fairway? What if there was a way you could own a great short game instantly? Introducing the all-new Alien Roswell Sand Wedge. The Alien Roswell's advanced design sole with the exclusive gravity rail system makes it nearly impossible for you to chunk it. I practice thousands and thousands of hours with my traditional sand wedge, but you don't have to with the Alien Roswell. Now you can try the instant automatic answer to solving your short game by going to aliengolf.com. Augusta Ranch Golf Club in Mesa has been voted the best executive course in Arizona. Challenging for all levels of players, it's family friendly and fun. Plus, it won't take you all day to play. There's an excellent practice range with PGA professionals to help you with your game and be sure to enjoy delicious food and beverages at the Scratch Pub and Grill. Make your next tee time at Augusta Ranch Golf Club by calling 480-354-1234 or by going to Augusta Ranch Golf. And now back to more match play with Ray Adams. Can you imagine the first five years of Jack Nicklaus's career? He never played on a Ryder Cup team because of some silly rule because you have to be a pro for four and a half or five years. And now Ricky Fowler gets chosen after only being on tour for one year. Yeah, they're pretty hypocritical, the PGA, okay? So anyway, so I get back and now I go to school. I go to the PGA school in Baltimore, Maryland, and I learn how to connect <laughs> the black line to the battery, which is negative, and the red line so a golf cart can run, basically, right? <laughs> so I sit there for two weeks freezing my rear end off in Baltimore, but I become a Class A member, so I can then make the Ryder Cup team. I go down with my cer certificate of, uh, you know, my award for being a Class A member, I go down to Dayton, Ohio. I drive down there to the to the national headquarters or the state headquarters. The PGA president at the time in Ohio is now on vacation, so I have it all there, documented. You know, I give it to somebody there at his office. They're going to mail it to him so I can get that in, so then I can make the Ryder Cup team in 1971. Unbelievable. For some reason, they don't get it. So when I come out in 69 or 70, whatever it is, after I do my basic training, uh, I actually beat Trevino that year. You'd have to look. It's either 69 or 70 for the Varden Trophy. But I'm not a Class A member because I can't win it now. Oh, my gosh. Because of some technicality that the guy didn't get my due diligence in time. So later on, a few years later, when it came time to play in that third Ryder Cup, yeah. you were like, you know what? Yeah, exactly right. That was part of it. You said, you know what? Come on. Yeah. Who cares? Yeah. Who cares? Got it. You didn't care about me. Let's let's talk a little bit about uh, a little bit more about some golf. You went on to the senior tour mm -hmm. and you played in the it's now called the Champions Tour. Your first Champions Tour win um, was uh, a win that had remember. some mixed results to it, and mixed Where? feelings, because a good friend of yours, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, a good friend of yours on tour died, Bert oh, Yancey. Bert Yancey was that my first win? I believe so. Talk about Bert Yancey Ooh. and your friendship with Bert. Well, Bert Yancey was a very close friend of mine. And uh, Tony Jacklin, Bert Yancey, the wives, the families, the children, all of us kind of traveled together. You know, we seemed to play the same events. We would babysit sit each other's kids. You know, we played practice rounds all together. We helped each other with our games because we knew each other's games so well. Mm -hmm. He had a big... He was uh, had a big input. He, he was a big factor in my 73 plane because I was putting poorly. He spent hours with me at Colonial on the, on the practice green there with a, 
uh, what do you call it, metrodome like this to try to and get... And you won Colonial I did. Year. That started me, okay? But he worked on my... He was, he, was, he was a brilliant guy and a great friend of mine. But anyway... He was also a very troubled man inside. Yes, he was. Tell uh, me about his friendship and, uh, and, uh, and well, the influence ongoing with his personal trouble. Well, Bert was what they define as a manic, manic schizophrenic. There is something, it's either a chemical imbalance in the body or a word can trigger an interaction inside that really results in a lot of anger, hostility, yeah. you know, uh, just violence almost yeah. to a point, I guess. I was playing with Bert at Westchester. Uh, <laughs> In, uh, I don't remember where it was. And anyway, it was Westchester. Rod Curl and I were playing with him, and, and I walked off the golf course. Uh, you had words with Bert. Yeah, I mean, Bert, uh, Bert unfortunately had the same pair of clothes on that I saw him on Wednesday, and he had a bandana saying irrational things, you know, out there. It just didn't make sense. You know, I'm watching my best friend, you know, he's, he's having a problem, you know. He had a meltdown. And yeah, he was, and I couldn't take it anymore. And I told you were Ryan, angry with him too. You guys had it out a little bit. Yeah, I, 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 I called for a ruling and I explained to the PGA, you know, official. I said, "There's a problem right here with Bert. I mean, we got to take this guy off the golf course. Something bad's going to happen. No, we can't do that. You know." So I played a few more holes, and finally, I had enough, and I walked in, and, and uh, I went to Jack Tuthill, who was in charge of the of the. Uh, the rules and and the and the guys that are in charge of rules, you know. And I said, Jack, something's going to happen. There's something wrong with Bert. Well, what, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be out there playing. I said, I can't watch it anymore. I, I quit. He said, Well, you you got to have a doctor's excuse. And I said, I, I just gave you my excuse. I'm not going to watch my best friend, you know, have a problem out there. We'll be right back after these messages. How many shots do you throw away from the sand, the rough, or even the fairway? What if there was a way you could own a great short game instantly? Introducing the all-new Alien Roswell Sand Wedge. The Alien Roswell's advanced design sole with the exclusive gravity rail system makes it nearly impossible for you to chunk it. I practice thousands and thousands of hours with my traditional sand wedge, but you don't have to with the Alien Roswell. Now you can try the instant automatic answer to solving your short game by going to aliengolf.com. A U and E or a C? Both have Ridgeback. These are loaded with peg. Which one are you gaming? Definitely E for me. It's just so forgiving. I'm definitely an E. C is for Cheka. What else? C is for kill it. C is me. Low spinning bombs. So, are you an E or a C? Hmm. I don't know. Hey, wait a minute. Pound for pound, nothing comes close. You've heard me talk about Squares Golf Shoes and how they help you hit the golf ball further. And many of you are saying, oh, come on, Faldo, give us a break. How is that possible? But yes, they do. And it's proven with science. What we noticed with the Square Shoes was the shoe keeps the pressure in a more stable fashion towards inside of the trail heel, allowing pressure to get to the lead side, generating much more club and speed and distance gain. Visit squares.com. Change your shoes, change your game. Squares, the distance golf shoe. Golf only exists because it's fun. What is special about golf is the relationships. Being out there with your family, your friends, so many different chances and opportunities are presented from the game of golf. Tune is brilliant. It's always first class experiences. Courses that they run, they want it to be a, as good as possible, and it makes a big difference for the experience. Why wouldn't you select Trim? You're selecting the best of the best. You know the quality you're getting, you know the experience you're getting. There's nobody better. 
customize your favorite ball from golf's top brands. Add your name or monogram, promote your business or event with a custom logo, or improve your game with a customized alignment aid. Call or order online at golfballs.com, the world leader in golf customization. Golfballs.com is the world leader in customized golf balls. Let us help to promote your company, tournament, or event with custom logo golf balls from the very best brands in golf. Call or request a free quote at golfballs.com, the world leader in golf customization. Get them while hot. We're like any normal family. We just get shorter wait times because we buy and book online at discounttire.com. So easy. Which gives us more time for things like. Oh, come on, Mom. <laughs> Ready? And it's all thanks to Kyle. <laughs> Thank you. Get 30% shorter average wait time when you buy and book online at DiscountTire.com. Let's get you taken care of. And now back to more match play with Ray Adams. And now the conclusion of Tom Weiskopf. He said, well, you got to have a doctor's excuse. So I said, Jack, you want me to ask my doctor, a good friend of mine, to write up a phony excuse? I said, I'm not hurt. I'm hurt inside watching my friend that night at the airport. Yeah. He had, he had a, a, a breakdown. I mean, they, they wrestled him to the ground, you know, unfortunately took him away, you know. Yeah. And I got fined the biggest fine in the history because I wouldn't give them a, a written doctor's How much were you fined? $3,500. Which and was I, a lot of money then. Well, it's a lot of money any, any, even right now. now yeah. Of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I put on a year's probation for telling the truth, right? And uh, anyway. When, when Bert died at the senior tour event that week, uh, I was on the practice facility, I believe. Yeah. So he won that tournament. I was standing there with Tony Jacklin. We were all playing about the same time. Tony was to my right, I was in the middle, and Bert was about two or three guys down. And the day before, uh, we were having lunch together, the three of us, and Bert was going like this. And I said, what's wrong? He said, I don't know, I just, I think I've been hitting too many balls. I said, well, you always hit too many balls. I said, why don't you go have the doctor look at you? You know, maybe you tore your rotator cuff or something, you know, pulled a muscle or something. Yeah. And he, you know, he said, I just don't feel right. You know, well, that was a symptom, which we all found out after the fact, you know, mm -hmm. of, you know, strokes and seizures and, and heart attacks. Anyway, I heard, heard this thud, Ray. And I looked over there, and there's Bert. He had hit the ground, just down. I walked over there, and Tony walked over there, and we didn't get too close to him. And, and they had some medical assistance right there by the practice tee anyway, you know, first aid, and they rushed out there, and he had already turned blue. And, and anyway, we went out to play, and, and they never, they, he had died when they were loading him up to take him to the hospital. He had died instantly from a massive heart attack. They never told all of us until we finished that day and they assembled all of us, yeah. you know, because we were concerned and, and uh, you know, I, I didn't want to play anymore, you know. Why did you go on? Well, I called, I called Jim, uh, one of his brothers, who I knew very well, who was the closest, I think, uh, two bird of the of the family members. They, they, it was a close family anyway, you know. And Jim said, "Night, Tom. You got Bert would want you to go through with it. You know, play. Go play for Bert." And I, I just can't do it, Jim. Anyway, I got through the second day, not bad, you know. But all of us were talking constantly, you yeah. know. And uh, I'll never forget this. Um, on the. Uh, 16th green, it's a par three, and Dave Stockton has me by two strokes. And I'm standing there, and I've got this 30-foot putt for a birdie. And for some reason, I said, Tom, keep your head still. Yancey always tells you to keep, Yance, I called him. Yance says, you always move your head, Big T. Keep your head still, stay down, and listen for the ball to go in the hole. And I lined this putt up, and I knew I was going to make it. I swear to God, I did, Ray. I got down there like this, and I hit it. And usually, I I always lift my head up. You know, I kept my head there. I kept my head there. You know, and I looked up. It was about three feet from the hole, and I raised my putter up in the air, turned my back to the hole. I mean, a lot of things could happen in three more feet. Yeah. 
Leroy McCase, it went in the center just perfectly, not even hard, you know. And I said to him, walking to the next tee, I said, I will win this golf tournament for Bert. I got big drive at the next hole, par five. I knew Stockton couldn't get there, and I whipped a three iron on the green, and I almost made eagle. And then uh, I birdied the last hole to tie him. I had about a 15-footer again. I said, and I kept my head still on that one. I just went like this, and I just heard the crowd roar. When I looked up, you know, the ball was gone. You know, I knew I had made it. Yeah. Now we go back to the same hole again. I've got almost the same putt, about 12 feet this time. Kept my head, boom. Now, you tell me there isn't something about that. He was there. He was there. Now You I loved Bert Yancey, didn't you? I, 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 I did. He was a big influence, a big help to me. He was as, as neat a guy as you could ever have as a friend. Yeah. You know, he was entertaining. Uh, he was a golf historian. Uh, he just was a super, super individual. And now it's time to improve your game with Jim McLean. the best-selling author and swing guru to the professional tour's biggest stars. Here's Jim. The subject for this morning is the takeaway. And I'm a gigantic believer in the one-piece takeaway. And a one-piece takeaway means that the club, the shaft, your hands, the arms, and the shoulders start things away together. And I'm pretty fanatical. I work on this all the time. It's one of the things I've worked on really hard with Keegan Bradley. And you practice that move until you insert that feel into your real golf swing. And then you'll have a backswing start that you can produce time after time. It's a simple move, but it has to be practiced, has to be repeated. But when, once you get a nice, simple takeaway, it's something you can do under pressure. Don't go away. We'll be right back after these messages. Are you an E or a C? Both have Ridgeback. These are loaded with tech. Which one are you gaming? Definitely E for me. It's just so forgiving. I'm definitely an E. C is for Cheka. What else? C is for kill it. C is me. Low spinning bombs. So, are you an E or a C? Hmm. I don't know. Hey, wait a minute. Pound for pound, nothing comes close. like any normal family. We just get shorter wait times because we buy and book online at discounttire.com. So easy. Which gives us more time for things like... Oh, come on, Mom. <laughs> Ready? And it's all thanks to Kyle. <laughs> Thank you. Get 30% shorter average wait time when you buy and book online at discounttire.com. Let's get you taken care of. You've heard me talk about Squares golf shoes and how they help you hit the golf ball further. And many of you are saying, oh, come on, Faldo, give us a break. How is that possible? But yes, they do. And it's proven with science. What we noticed with the Square shoes was the shoe keeps the pressure in a more stable fashion towards the inside of the trail heel, allowing pressure to get to the lead side, generating much more club and speed and distance gain. Visit squares.com. Change your shoes, change your game. Squares, the distance golf shoe. with Ray Adams. 1973 Canadian Open, you beat Nicholas in the playoff. Talk about that. How sweet was that victory? Well, it was. Um, you know, I had uh, accumulated quite a few wins up until that time. Yes. I, uh, I won Colonial, and then I won the week after, and then I went to the U.S. Open, and Johnny Miller, I finished third there, had a chance to, you know, beat him, and I didn't. So I finished third there at Oakmont, and then I went to the 
the next tournament, I don't even remember where it was, and I won that, and then I went to the British Open, and I won that, and I came back, and I didn't play for a couple of weeks, and I went to the Canadian Open. We were playing in uh, Montreal. Actually, I won both Canadian Opens in, in Montreal. Montreal was good to me. Good, great restaurants, great town, a lot of fun. Um, and uh, I think Nicholas, if you check his record, either finished second in the Canadian Open seven or nine times. Anyway, he was playing ahead of me. I was in the last group. And uh, he pulled his tee shot. I couldn't see that until I got up on the tee at 18. I saw where he played his second shot from, and he, he hit an unbelievable shot up on the green out of some heavy rough. And uh, we were tied at the time. So I, he, you know, I hit my ball down the fairway, and uh, Jack two putted for four. And um, I, I went for the pin. I think I had a six or seven iron for a second shot. And I pushed it a little bit, and it hit on the side of the green, just hit on the fringe, kicked down a little bit. And I had kind of a testy little chip pitch. And I remember I, I played it, and I really thought I could make it. You know, it was, it was touchy, but it, it was a good enough shot and a good enough lie where I could have pitched it in. That's the way I was thinking at the time. You sure. Know? Very confident. And I hit a very, very good chip and just left it short about a foot. And I tapped in, you know. And then we went to sudden death. And at that time, uh, you drew, you know, one or two, a straw. And you had the choice at that time. Now there's no choice. You, if you draw one, you must hit first. Yeah. I drew one, and I said, I'll hit second. Okay. And Jack kind of gave Why me Why did a, you choose that? Well, because I wanted to see what he was going to do on this particular hole, okay. because it was either a driver <clears throat> off the tee. It was a good par four, not long, but it was protected the green on the second shot with water. At that point, it was match play golf. It was, that's right. And I wanted to see what he was going to do. You know, I just felt that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. And he played a, uh, uh, a one iron off the tee put it in the fairway, and I decided to play a three-wood. I, I, I was a very good one-iron player, but I wanted to get down there a little further than he did and uh, because I didn't want to hit first. If I didn't get my tee shot past him, you know, I, I, I just didn't want, I, I wanted to always see what he was going to do. I just, that's the way I had it in my mind. That's the way I wanted to approach it. And I hit a three-wood just past him about 10, 15 yards. And he played a beautiful, uh, I believe it was a six iron, about 10 feet, beautiful shot. And I had a seven iron shot, and I hit it in there about three and a half feet, about like this. Mm -hmm. And he just missed his putt. And uh, I just got up there and had a smile on my face, you know, and I kind of looked at him a little bit, you know. And I wasn't rooting for him, you know, I mean, I was happy he missed his putt. You never root, you know, you, right. you want to win the best way you can, you yeah. know. And because now I had my opportunity. So I knocked the ball in and he said, uh, you had a little smile on your face. And I said, yeah. And he said, hmm. I said, well, I just knew I wasn't going to, I knew I was going to beat you. I knew I wasn't going to miss that putt. He said, you knew you weren't going to miss that putt? I said, yeah. He said, good putt. Great championship. So anyway, the funny part about it is now he has to go in the the scoring room, you know, the press room first, you know, and now he's a little bit upset. Yeah. That he has lost the Canadian Open in a playoff, and he says, you know, it's it's amazing to me that they don't have a 18 hole playoff for such a significant championship. You know, I had to listen to all this. So oh, of course now I get the question, you know about it as I follow him. You know, I, I think that was the seventh or ninth time so he finished. So he was, he was, ups he was. He was upset. He was mad about that. Yeah, but it, a gracious champion. Sure, yeah. One of the best you'd ever, if you beat him, you knew that you accomplished something and he was the first to say, great playing. Yeah. And uh, anyway, uh, they asked me the question and I just said, hey, I don't make the rules here, you know. And I and I and he was back there signing autographs or talking. And I, and I did say, but I really felt kind of confident that I could beat him. 
don't, I don't know if you heard me or not. You know. That was a sweet. I had one. to give it a little. You had to give it well, a little I mean, twist. You know, be well, you'd taken very... it for years, though. You had taken it from the media and from a lot of people. Oh for yeah, a long time. but you know, I, I was just teasing them. You know. Let's talk about following in those footsteps or in that shadow. Did that create some of that anger, some of that frustration that you were constantly being compared to Nicholas, and you couldn't be the Tom Weiskopf that you wanted to be? Well, I, I just wanted to be left alone. I, I didn't, you know. My former wife at the time was reading an article that was written in the Columbus uh, paper there. We had two very prominent writers at the time, Paul Horning mm -hmm. and Kay Kessler. They were real golf writers. They knew the game. You know, they weren't there just on a golf assignment, you know, because they covered Ohio State football or Ohio yeah. State basketball or the NBA or whatever. You know, they were true golf uh, historians, you yeah. know, they they knew the players individually, and, and that has changed an awful lot today. So when you're in this community, you know, where Jack didn't even live, you know, he grew up there. I didn't grow up there, you know. He then left and went to Florida, but it was all about Nicholas, you know. It was his sure. regime, and uh, I read the article first, and I discarded the newspaper down on the on the thing of, about how I played bad and why I can't, you know, live up to these expectations basically was the gist of the article. A, you know, I don't mind somebody saying things ab about me if they're true. Fair enough. Sure. But when, when they stretch the point a little bit, you know, I, I, I get To a get little, readers or whatever. Yeah, whatever. Did you ever talk to Jack about this? Did you and Jack no. ever talk about it? No. Is there anything... Is there anything that you've ever wanted to say to Jack Nicholas about this or anything that you no, haven't said to him? Not really. No, because in a way, uh, we've talked about, we've gone on some hunting and fishing trips in the past together, get along good, you know, respect each other, I think. Uh, you know, uh, I, in a way, idolized him. You know, I mean, I, when I went to Ohio State, you know, I'd been, only been playing golf for three years, and I'd look at this guy, and I thought, I had never seen anybody hit a golf ball like that. Absolutely. You know, good gracious. You know, this guy was so unbelievable. But you could hit it as far or farther. I could hit it further. And you could hit it. <laughs>
Augusta Ranch Golf Club in Mesa has been voted the best executive course in Arizona. Challenging for all levels of players, it's family friendly and fun. Plus, it won't take you all day to play. There's an excellent practice range with PGA professionals to help you with your game and be sure to enjoy delicious food and beverages at the Scratch Pub and Grill. Make your next tea time at Augusta Ranch Golf Club by calling 480-354-1234 or by going to Augusta Ranch Golf golf.com and now back to more match play with ray adams Let's talk about um, your golf course design business. You got involved in designing golf courses, um, a passion of yours. Uh, you did it in order to help move away from golf a little bit and do something a little different, but stay in golf. Why did you go to golf course design? Why did you become very good at that? That's a good question. Um, at the time, it was about 1983 or 84. I was very unhappy with myself as a person. Why? The, the way I, I was drinking too much. I was just not giving golf what it deserved. You know, I didn't put a lot into my golf game. Um, it, it was easy for me to beat myself up at times, you know, emotionally mm -hmm. for lack of accomplishments. There was some dark times there for you, weren't there? Oh yeah, real dark. Yeah. How dark did it get? Bad. The big problem was my drinking problem. I was, I don't know what. Did you love booze or was it just a way to escape? It was a way to escape and also have fun with friends. There were times when I came home and I was in the wrong driveway. Couldn't even recognize, you know, <laughs> what was it, Charlie Sheen wouldn't even, what was it, Letterman, the latest joke is, he could pull in the driveway and not even know, you know, it's his own house, you Unbelievable. know. Unbelievable. And anyway. Did you seek help? No. No. To where did you go or what did you go inwardly or uh, to your spiritual faith or what? Where did no, you go I, for the, how did you come out of yeah. that dark time? How I got out of that dark time was I just said to myself, I need to try to do something that I've always had an interest in. Make that commitment. I still have many good years left mm -hmm. as a player. I have an op opportunity to get into golf course design here in Scottsdale, Arizona mm -hmm. with the project True and Country Club, my sure. first one. Maybe this is a good time to take a sabbatical, to, to, to get away from it. At that time, I was the fourth all-time lady money winner. Yeah. Only three guys had won more money than I had. You know, that was Nicholas Watson and Trevino. And uh, so I had a good career. There were other players that had won more tournaments, but I was consistent. I was right there, but I, was, I just was very frustrated where I was in life. I was just... Not satisfied, I, I wasn't comfortable with what I was doing. So let's try this golf course design. I've always been interested in it. Sure. I had read about you know architecture for years, curious about it. I had gone on a couple site visits with Jack Nicholas, offered some suggestions, you know, and he'd use some of them. So maybe I knew what I was doing. So if I didn't like it, it's right here in my hometown. I can always go back to playing. Sure. Never did. No. Never did. Tom, are you a great golf course designer because you were a great player in the past? Is that a requirement? It's not a requirement, but I think it's a tremendous help. If you've had the chance, even casually, to play all these so-called great courses, which they are all over the world, you know, the ones that are really respected, always referred to, people just love them, you know, uh, you remember their characteristics. You, you've seen in competition on those types of courses, you've seen the best players play them. You've seen the results of great shots that were hit that there was no good result at all, you know? So you say, well, I'm not gonna ever do that. 
it helps to have played and have seen all these wonderful courses because they all have different characteristics like the fall offs and the false fronts and and the Donald Ross style and the and the Thomas and the Bell and and McDonald and all they all have uniqueness you know but they're still all copies of of the stuff that's everybody's always liked you know so I like to blend the flavor of all those guys into my courses you know I don't know if I'm great. I, 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 I designed to this statistic, though, which I think is very important as a designer. There are 26 million golfers in the United States. Defined as a golfer by the National Golf Foundation is anyone that plays 10 rounds of golf in his season. 92% of 26 million do not break 90. Sure. Okay. One half of 1%, that's 130,000, assuming they play by the rules, no mulligans off the first tee, none of this in the leather, break 80. One half of 1%. You have to think about everybody that plays this game, and they, it's such a difficult game. You've got to give people a chance to play to certain places if they're smart enough and can see that where they know that they can miss it there and still recover and still go on and play the hole. Somebody once said, there's no reason why a hole shouldn't be designed where a bogey can't easily be achieved if you use your head, even if there's water on the hole. Mm -hmm. you know? But it becomes pretty controversial and pretty demanding when you have to be a heck of a golfer to effectively play the hole without, with precision. You Especially know. when you're dealing with 27 million people, not well, that's right. two or three hundred. That's right. You know, Tom Weisskopf, uh, what an amazing career. They called you the Towering Inferno, <laughs> but uh, that's okay. you, you got through some very dark times, and with hunting, family, uh, your personal inward uh, strength, uh, your golf course design, I think the Towering Inferno has been extinguished. Well, thank you. Thank man. you for being on Match that. Play. Appreciate that, right? Thank you. Now, they, the thing I like about Montana, they don't give a sh who you are, or, you know, what you are. I watch Jeff Bridges walk downtown Bozeman all the time and the heads never turn. I think it's important to start your day by getting your energy flowing and your body ready. That's great, but some days I need more. If you want to be great at something, it takes hard work and focus. Other times, I want more. There's nothing better than finding time to slow down for a meal with family and friends. Is there a chance of even more? It's absolutely amazing when you can sit around a fire to finish off the day. I'm so glad I found a place for all my mores. Quality products at a fair price.